Geopolitics and Empire welcomes back to the broadcast renowned forecaster Martin Armstrong of armstrongeconomics.com. Welcome back to Geopolitics and Empire, Mr. Armstrong. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Now, uh, you have produced uh, a short book titled The Plot to Seize Russia, which you will be handing out to attendees of your upcoming World Economic Conference uh, from November 11th uh, to the 13th, uh, 2022, so just in a few months. And as well, the, the book will be available for people to purchase um, in digital or, or, or physical uh, format. And uh, the, I, I've, I've read um, the, the beginning uh, of, of the book, and the information in your book comes from Freedom of Information Act requests, which have provided never-before-seen documents, reports, and transcripts pertaining to Clinton, Yeltsin, and what was going on in the 90s between the U.S. and Russia. You, you were also uh, sort of caught up, caught up in what was going on. And apparently the plot was to seize control of Russia, uh, installing their own co-conspirator, Boris Berezovsky, he, uh, you say that he wanted to take control of Russia and even merge it into NATO, becoming a vassal state of the West with him as president for life. I believe later Ber Berezovsky was sorry and wanted to return to Russia. And I think he wrote a letter to Putin. Uh, so, you know, tell us what, what's really been going on between East and West, between Washington, London, Brussels, NATO and w Moscow. And, and where are we uh, today? Well, actually, um, <clears throat> stepping back a little bit further, in 1991, um, which has been omitted from all the history books, but has been revealed from these documents. NATO actually proposed to Russia to uh, to join, and that was um, what appears to be one of the primary motives for the coup against Gorbachev at the time, because uh, you still had um, at least a third of of people in the Duma at that time, there were probably still the hardline communists. So they saw that as more or less the surrender of Russia to the United States. And so that was one of the reasons for the coup. Um, and there were a, a lot of a lot of intrigue in there. And um, it, it was perhaps you might recall Maxwell, who was supposedly a almost a triple spy from Israel, et cetera. He had actually cut a deal that Israel would support the coup if they released all the Jews and they could go to, to Israel. Um, and I got all the documents on that as well. And so <clears throat> when the coup failed, Gorbachev basically still made a deal and let the Jews go to, to Israel at that time. Um, it was really a contest. Uh, in 1996, they, they call it the Davos Pact, where Barisnovsky and his seven oligarchs, um, Yeltsin was only at maybe 10% in the polls. So um, they band together to influence that election. And all the documents say if they don't do that and, the, and the, the communists get back in, they'll all be in work camps in Siberia. <laughs> so um, obviously they had a, a self-interest in making sure that Yeltsin won. So uh, that's what they did. They did uh, rig the election any which way they could possibly do it. And Yeltsin was reelected. And uh, that was 1996. So what was happening at that stage was that uh, Barisnovsky was just one of these people, I think, that thirst for power. Um, I guess when you, you know, when you have billions, you can't spend it. All right. So what are you going to do? I mean, um, you know, you can go buy very fancy houses or a yacht for 150 million, you know, but you know, you're still still not even at one billion, you know. So um, at that stage, you're talking about money that is really poker chips at a political table. It, it's beyond, you know, wealth or being able to actually materialize it one way or another. So I think once you cross that line, some people just seem to go. Um, a bit insane. Uh, we have people that are, you know, 
I, I think like Bill Gates trying to, you know, do things with the world. You also have uh, Klaus Schwab, you know, trying to change. They, they seem to get, to get some sort of, they, they cross a line. And Barisnovsky did the same thing. They suddenly want to, you know, do something for the world or control it one way or another. George Soros, the same, the same situation. So I think when you get to a, a level of money that can't be spent, uh, you end up with these fancy dreams of doing something else and, and depends what side of the fence you're on, you know, but um, yeah, that reminds me yeah. of the, of the video games. Like uh, if people recall age of empires or Sims or civilization. So these rich uh, elites, as you say, they're bored. And so they want to play Sims with us. Uh, so yeah. we are their little yeah. uh, video game. It, very much. So, I mean, like I said, it's money you can't spend. So what are you going to do with it? You know, it's um, there is also uh, for the American Constitution, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. That was all about uh, the Princess Savoy, who had told Montesquieu that the reason wars always took place was because the kings had all these armies. And they were just sitting there paying them and like, well, go do something, you know. <laughs> so he was against standing armies. Um and that, you know, you, so the Second Amendment in the United States was really supposed to be a militia, uh, not to have a standing army all the time, because uh, that led to war. And it, it seems he was correct, I think. Um, so this is what we were dealing with back then. Barisnovsky, after 96, I think just thirst for more power. And he tried to pull off a, a, a blackmail of, of Yeltsin in July 99. Um, he had hoped that he would be his nominee, and it just wasn't working out that way. He got caught uh, spending over $3 million on bugging you know, Barisnovsky's, uh, I mean, Barisnovsky bugging bl uh, uh, Yeltsin and, and his whole family phone lines and everything. So he was always collecting data that he could use to blackmail somebody with. Um, so the Bank of New York thing was effectively what the blackmail was about. They, they steered money for their so-called refurbishment of the Kremlin through Switzerland. Uh, IMF money was steered in there. And then um, his co-conspirator was Edmund Saffer, who ran Republic National Bank in New York. And he was critical because the only way to get uh, the government to go after the bank in New York was he filed what is called a suspicious transaction report. Now, Barisnovsky wasn't a bank, so he couldn't file one of those. So they needed Edmund for that, pers you know, from that perspective. So as soon as Eben filed that, then the U.S. ran into Bank of New York and then Barisnovsky went and said, hey, if you don't resign, this is all going to come out. And that's when Yeltsin was actually caught between um, two forces. The, the communists had filed an impeachment motion. They were trying to get rid of them. Uh, back, you know, based on all this, you know, suppose, you know, this corruption. And then he had Barisnovsky and the oligarchs on the other side trying to blackmail him. So he became president. So that's actually how he turned to Putin. And all the documents show that Putin was not a communist and he wasn't an oligarch. Um, and they basically said, you know, nobody knew him. I mean, he was just you know, from the middle of both both sides, uh, the nonsense about him being KGB and all this stuff. As soon as you know, 1991 came in, it, it collapsed. He resigned, and he was never a senior spy or something like that. Um, uh, he was a diligent worker, but that was all. He was never rose to the ranks. Uh, so most of that was. Uh, pretty much propaganda inspired, you know, by Barisnovsky because he was 
he was trying to change Yeltsin's mind. Um, so Yeltsin had turned to, to Putin on August 9th uh, and <clears throat> of 98. And <clears throat> after that is when, you know, uh, it was most likely Barisnovsky and Gazinsky that staged the whole um, allegations against bombing of, of the apartment buildings. Um, I mean, Putin didn't need it. He was instantaneously very popular. He had over 70% pop, you know, population, you know, or popularity vote because the people knew he wasn't a communist and he wasn't an oligarch. So in, in a interesting sense, it could have been like, he was almost like a Trump in Russia, mm -hmm. you know, from, um, not really part of either side. And so the people really were behind him for that reason. Would you say just re real quick, these Russian oligarchs like Berezovsky, uh, I mean, there's a Time magazine article, I, I don't know if it's from the 90s, but which talks about how the Clinton administration was backing Yeltsin. So w would you say was the West also backing or involved with these Russian oligarchs trying to seize power? A message from our sponsors. It seems we may be headed for the 1930s all over again. Financial collapse, tyranny and world war. I've already secured multiple passports, offshore accounts, safe havens, and escaped to the sunnier shores of Mexico. My friend Mikkel Thorup of the Expat Money Show is hosting the Expat Money Summit with 30-plus experts that'll help you reclaim freedom in this fourth turning by moving your life and wealth offshore. Protect yourself and secure a new life abroad. Register now for free at expatmoneysummit.com or don't and enjoy surviving on insect protein while stuck in the metaverse. Since 2020, Ron Unz of Unz.com has argued the COVID outbreak was due to a U.S. biowarfare attack against China and Iran. Jeffrey Sachs, the Russian Ministry of Defense, and others are now making similar suggestions. Weeks before COVID appeared in Wuhan, a top U.S. biowarfare official ran the Crimson Contagion exercise on how to protect America against infection if a dangerous virus suddenly appeared in China. After COVID appeared in Wuhan, it jumped to Iran, infecting Iranian leadership only weeks after America had assassinated Iran's military commander. Iran publicly accused America of an illegal biowarfare attack and filed a complaint with the UN. Ron Unz has produced a free ebook and is available for interviews to further discuss this issue. And don't forget to fund Geopolitics and Empire. You can leave a donation, except on Patreon or PayPal, which have banned us, book a consultation, or become a member. The, they probably, like the Kennedy assassination, they didn't release the most damaging ones. But what I have is all the documents where they're explaining, come on, support us. They never say no. They don't say yes. But they knew all along what, what the deal was. Um, and like Primakov was, was in line and in May of 98, Boris, you know, Boris basically says to them, I'll have him removed. He's, he's a threat. He really wants to be president. And May came in and 98 and Primakov was removed. So he had a lot of power. Uh, that's why they called him also the godfather of, of, a, of the Kremlin. Um, so it, it doesn't absolutely confirm that the Clintons agreed. It also doesn't show that they disagreed. Uh, so there's probably other documents. And I suspect based upon the, the reactions that came after it is that they were agreeing. Um, they just didn't want to be caught up in it and let it be appear to be independent uh, is what it seemed to be. Um, but when Yeltsin then turns to, to Putin, uh, it kind of changed everything. And then that's where the oligarchs start all this, uh, you know, constantly saying, oh, he's a KGB, he's this, he's that, um, when in fact he wasn't. Um, but that was all more or less trying to get Barisnovsky you know, in that position, and why don't you give it to me instead of this guy Putin that nobody heard of? Um, I mean, I even have uh, documents showing that one of the oligarchs said Barisnovsky never supported uh, Putin. He didn't introduce him. He didn't even know him. 
Uh, so when he was saying, oh, he really helped Putin come to power, that was all nonsense, too. That was Baristovsky just trying to, to boost his own image. Um, so it, it was pretty much that. Um, I even have the, the, the conversation of Yeltsin when the Bank of New York uh, broke that scandal. <clears throat> I think it's September 8th. Yeltsin calls um, uh Clinton, and he says, look, this is political, and uh, I'm sending over the Minister of Interior to investigate. So um, pretty much everything is is documented from that perspective. Um, And I think it's important from today's um, viewpoint to really understand, one, how Putin came to power. And you hear a lot of propaganda now that they make it sound that's the same uh, theories that they used in the Middle East. Oh, if we go in, we take out this dictator, the people will cheer us and, and we'll get ticker tape parades or something like that. And, and that theory has never worked once. And um, so this propaganda about, gee, removing Putin and, you know, like everything will be, you know, perfect again. It, it's just nonsense. Uh, the danger here is that the there are still the hardline communists that wanted to resurrect the USSR. And it, you can just Google a lot of their comments. They're the ones who are threatening nuclear war and all this. It's not Putin. You remove Putin and it's not, I'm telling you, the, the other guys are going to have their shot then. Mm-hmm. And it will be a lot worse um, they're criticizing Putin in uh, over Ukraine. <clears throat> Putin has actually done what he said he was wanted to do. Just go in and free the Donbass. If you just look at it objectively, when the U.S. went into Iraq, what do you do? You go in, you take out the power grid, you take out the, the communications, and you attack the water supply. He has done none of that. Um, so the hardliners are criticizing him for being too soft on Ukraine. And I think that's very important to understand because like when, um, Boris Johnson said, oh, you know, we would use nukes against Russia. You know, they came out and said, you realize that just one of ours will take out all of Britain. Um, you know, and we have to understand that a hundred megaton bomb would take out the entire island. Mm -hmm. All right. (laughs) Hiroshima was a 10th of that. So, I mean, the, the magnitude of the weapons today is substantially higher than it was before. Just to to go back uh, a second, uh, as you brought us up to Putin and, and the year 2000, We've seen for centuries the West has been uh, attempting to stri- strategically take over Russia, you know, from Napoleon to uh, Hitler and, uh, you know, the, the Mackinder thesis, the Anglo-American geopolitical strategy to, um, you know, keep the barbarians from, from coming together. And then we've got these RAND white papers, and as, as you're outlining uh, as well, has the goal been to, and, and Putin said this, I think, like a decade ago, he said this over and over, that they want to defang and declaw the, the Russian bear, do you feel the, the goal up until uh, Berezovsky was to effectively dismember uh, the Atlantic recently published an article talking about decolonize Russia? I mean, is this uh, the goal of the West? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, you from two perspectives. One, you have um, also you have the neocons in, in the West that were like uh, John McCain, for example. Um, And I don't, you know, I I have put in this book showing that he's been against Russia, didn't matter who it was. Um, He was there, you know, talking against Russia before Putin even came to power. Uh, So it's, you know, why uh, it's hard to explain other than it didn't matter, I think, before, okay, fine, they were communists, etc. But communism fell and they didn't want to respect that. Um, 
I think some of these people honestly just can't sleep at night unless they have an enemy. Um, then on the other side, you have people like Eben Saffer. Why did he join in? Because they're bankers. Now, I knew Edmund. He was a gold bug. You know, what he was drooling over was having Barisnovsky as president and free access to all the resources of Russia. So he wasn't interested necessarily in the, in the military defanging or, or something. He just wanted to, to loot the country, basically. Um, so you had two separate types of ideas. Uh, with the end result being the same. But, you know, you have to understand the thinking process behind some of these people and not just look at the end result. Um, but yes, uh, even long before, I mean, Hitler went in, Napoleon went in. Russia has uh, tremendous resources. Uh, and in, in 1917, most people don't realize, but when the revolution took place, Russia had the largest official gold reserves in the world. Um, they're still missing because they basically took it and they they hid it someplace and nobody knows where. They thought they threw it in, it in the bottom of a lake or buried it in the forest or something to stop the communists from getting it. Um, but, I mean, that says a lot. I mean, the, the amount of, of wealth that Russia had was far in excess of, of, of Europe. So you had always a financial interest, which was uh, that of Napoleon and, and, um, and Hitler was not necessarily the, just the communist side, uh, but uh, certainly not for Napoleon. It was just, you know, you know <clears throat> getting all that wealth. And in terms of the, the this, this plot to seize uh, Russia, I gather it has, failed uh miserably that i i recall in grad school being assigned uh the, the reading of um, putin's thesis from the late 90s uh his thesis was on natural uh resources and um it, it, he kind of the last two decades it seems putin and, and and company and medvedev and others have brought back uh russia and then now we we find ourselves in this ukraine situation and uh some say you know it's been provoked uh, by the West, you know, to, to, to what end? They continue to fund the appropriations. I think just a few days ago, on yet another 600 million from U.S. Congress to to Kiev. Um, how do you see the current Ukraine situation in the context of of everything that's that's going on? Uh, yes, I mean, if you step back a little bit further, even um, <clears throat> Obama wanted to go into Syria. That was all over a pipeline. Uh, Qatar wanted to run through there uh, to get gas to Europe to compete with Russia. All right. So that's why uh, when Assad said no, uh, Obama tried saying, oh, well, he's abusing his people, the same nonsense. Uh, and, you know, Americans basically said enough of these endless wars. And so he, he didn't get the support to go in. But that's what that was over. It, it was trying to basically harm Russia from the economic perspective. Because then Ukraine has always been seen as the, the key linchpin because uh, Ukraine is the flatlands into Moscow. All right. That's where Napoleon tried to go in uh, and, and Hitler. And, and the Russians always said, why didn't God put mountains there? You know, but um so all the pipelines to Europe go through Ukraine. That's why they built the Nord Stream underneath the, the sea there, because that was the only other way to get, get it in. So Ukraine was a, was a strategic part. And this idea that if they could cut off the energy uh, from Russia to Europe, then that would break the back of Russia itself. So... Um, Putin is strategically trying to redirect off, you know, also off into, into Asia. But you take this, the sanctions that they've done, this is very serious because it has um, destroyed really the world economy. It's one thing to sanction one country versus another. 
But when they started going after the private assets of oligarchs, claiming, oh, they're really holding assets for Putin or they supported Putin. I mean, this is all just propaganda. Um, you, you have a guy named Bill Browder out there saying, oh, Putin, Putin's the richest man in the world. He's 200 billion. There is no possible way uh, Putin could have that kind of money. There's no assets uh, in Russia that would have been worth that. That's more than Bezos has with, with Amazon. All right. If he took all the assets of all the oligarchs, he still wouldn't reach that kind of a number. And he was claiming that he took only 50 percent, which is complete propaganda. All right. But the danger here is that when you start confiscating private assets, you violated international law. Now, from, you know, I've been a hedge you know, fund manager and one of the critical things you look at is, is country risk. I mean, I would never put a client into Iran because there was always a risk that they could just nationalize the assets. So you have to look at things like that. This attack on private assets is very serious because now if I was advising, you know, wealthy Chinese, I'd have to say, you better reassess what you're doing because if suddenly uh, the U.S. and the West gets angry at China and puts sanctions on, they might come after you too. Well, we saw a recent example where in Turkey, uh, you know, as a result, the Russians have created their own Visa Mastercard system, the the Mir payment system. And Turkey initially began to accept it, and just a few days ago, uh, they've halted uh, the the Mir payment system in, in Turkey. So I guess that kind of goes to what you're saying. Yes. I mean, it's it's a uh, it, this is all political uh, and it, it you have to be really careful about what's going on here. Th these people think that they can actually somehow some way defeat Russia. And then what are they going to do? Then next is China. Um, and it, it's just really quite absurd uh, they think that they they're using the Ukraine, uh, they think, to basically, you know, weaken Russia. So then after that, the NATO could just could just take them. Um, you know, this I don't know. These are you know, people that that played with war games on, you know, when they were children or something. I, I don't really understand it. Um, it. It's if you look at the Roman Empire. What made Rome last for a thousand years? It was free trade. Yes, they would conquer these countries. And then they saw that whatever they manufactured, they could sell to Rome. So it created a, a, a vast economy. And as long as people benefit, then they, won't, <clears throat> they don't revolt. All right. So that was pretty much it. I mean, World peace is created not by threats, but by world trade. And you're undermining that. I mean, the first thing, I mean, you know, China has done well. And a war with the United States undermines many of its companies that rely upon selling something to America. So you, you, it's world peace that creates uh, advances society and, and raises the living standards for everybody. And by these sanctions and doing this to individual Russians is very, very serious. You've divided the world economy. Um, China understands that. They're creating their chip system. Um, so <clears throat> when Russia went into Crimea in 2014, Obama went to SWIFT and wanted them to be removed. SWIFT rejected it. And they said no. This is not here for political purposes. They changed the, the head of the SWIFT system in 2019, and he just does whatever he's told. Uh, and that was a serious blow because uh, now if you do not have a clearing system for the world economy, it's over with. It's the end of globalization, et cetera. This is not you know, uh, going to end well. Uh, we're not going back to, to normal. It's even if you get the Republicans in on November, it's not going to change anything.
Yeah, just to get your thought on, on the economy. I mean, I, I've had uh, listeners to this podcast, I mean, from Russia, mail me when the sanctions came in some months ago, someone from Russia said, sorry, I can't donate to the podcast anymore because I've been locked out of the, the SWIFT uh, system. And um, just to get your take on the economy, I mean, the situation in the US and, and Western Europe seems to be the worst. We're starting to see signs of social unrest. There's talk of uh, civil war. Uh, it seems Europe is the biggest loser uh, in, in all of this. You know, w- how do you see this un- unfolding? W- will we end up eating the bugs? <laughs> uh, well, Klaus Schwab wants you to do that, but uh, uh, look, this is is <clears throat> again. I I've, I've been dealing with governments for forty years. You know, I met many heads of state. I was friends with Margaret Thatcher. This is. The worst crop of world leaders I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you know, there's nobody in any of these countries, um, in Europe or or Biden or Canada, that I could sit down and even have an intelligent conversation with. Uh, it, it's it's that bad. So, it the people behind them are basically writing these things. Most of them are just climate zealots, and uh, so. They have no idea about how the world functions. All they care about is CO2. And this idea, oh, well, is really that we'll just cut off the, the fossil fuels and then something new, then people will accept windmills and electric cars and whatever. They, they have no idea the pain that they're, they cause in, in the intro. Uh, you see a lot of these <clears throat> civil wars starting uh, civil unrest in third world countries because, all right, it might cost me double to fill up my car. I survive. All right. But somebody in a third world country, that that means they can't put food on the table for their for their family. Um, So and the prices are even higher for them. So it's add to that the dollar rises because of the civil unrest in Europe. The EU is is a complete disaster. Uh, it uh, it will break up and fall apart because they never designed it correctly to begin with. Um, I mean, they did come to me, and I argued that look, <clears throat> uh, you have to consolidate the debts to be any kind of a competitor against the dollar, because um, they were just looking at it like oh, well, you have one interest rate and uh, one currency, and that's what they were pitching in Europe. And I said, it's not going to work. All right, we have 50 states, single currency, but they all pay different interest rates depending upon their creditworthiness. And that's what's happened in Europe. So then you get these arguments, oh, it's not fair, you know, Italy's paying more than this one or whatever. That's the way it is. All right, they never designed uh, Europe correctly to begin with. Mainly because coal in Germany, he admits that he acted like a dictator. He never let the German people vote on it because he knew he would lose. Uh, he said he would lose seven to one. So he just took Germany into the euro by himself. And he wouldn't agree to consolidating the debts because he knew that was the biggest issue to the Germans. Um, that they're going to be taking in the Greek debt, then, then, you know, that was against it. So his view is fine. I'm going in, but you cannot consolidate the debts. And I warned them, this is going to fail. Uh, I said, everybody's going to be paying different interest rates based upon their credit worthiness. So, you know, they said to me at that time, uh, well, it's okay. We just have to get the euro in. Then we'll worry about the debt problem later. Well, here we are. All right. Um, that was 1997, and uh, they still haven't addressed the, the debt problem. So that's just the way it always is with governments. So Europe is is a, a real basket case, uh, honestly. Uh, they lowered interest rates to negative in 2014. Simultaneously, they had laws that pension funds had to be safe and secure, so they had to have 70% or higher of government debt. We well, just lowered the interest rate to negative. You got pension funds that are bankrupt and can't, you know, they'll, they'll never be able to, to pay out what they owe. 
Uh, so this is why Schwab is, is back in there talking about uh, the Great Reset, which is really uh, a default on all the debt, and because that's what it's going to come to. And when he says, oh, you'll own nothing and be happy, that's just a, uh, a sales job. Make it sound they're doing this for you. It's really for them. They can't pay the debts. So uh, this is really, you know, much of the, of the problem. And so you get into this guaranteed basic income theory. That's to replace the pension funds they wiped out. So, it, you know, you have to just sort through all the propaganda from every which side and then you see what's going on. But, I mean, most of the attack at this point on Russia is because of climate change. And, um, you know, you know they're, they're blaming all the inflation on, on, on Putin, which is nonsense. I mean, they started this as soon as, as you know, Biden was elected. California just out, you know, said they're outlawing uh, all fossil fuel cars and you're, everybody's going to have to have electric. Well, the power grid just was stretched and they were telling people to turn off their air conditioning because they can't. Have, and now you want all the cars to be electric, too. I mean, honestly, that's what I mean. I've never seen such incompetence in my entire life. There is no alternative uh to a fossil fuel that's established and ready. Uh, the internet's not even going to be able to stay up. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I see people actually believing the propaganda that, uh, here in Europe. I mean, they're, they're believing it's it's Putin's fault. And uh, e even just before we connected, I, I was afraid we wouldn't be able to do this interview because the electricity for like the second or third or fourth time here in Croatia has was cut out. I don't know what's going on. And um, uh, where, where do you see uh all of this going i think you've been saying that you th you think they're not going to succeed but i think uh it's going to be a world uh of pain you know we, i think you mentioned before the threat of the thucydides trap you know some crazies in washington might i mean they're talking about m tactical mini nukes there's that uh but uh on the other side what we just recently had the meeting in uh, samarkand uh, uzbekistan uh xi jinping was there putin erdogan and narendra modi of india uh, one of my recent guests, uh, Greg Copley of the International Strategic Studies Association, said this perhaps was the most S the most important SEO meeting uh, ever. And so, you know, there's there's world war, there's economic collapse, there's the East sort of getting their house in, in order. Where do you see this uh, uh, going? Because I, I agree with you, the EVs uh, is not tenable. Thomas Massey has come out and said he's an MIT scientist that we need four times the amount, you know, of, of the electrical grid that we have, we need that times four to be able to do any of this. That, that's just not feasible. Yes, it's, it's not. It's completely nuts. Um, and <clears throat> even if you look at what they have done, I mean, you can go to my site. We've put in the historical um, uh, <clears throat> climate evidence. Uh, they were only looking from 1850 on. Well, 1650 was the bottom in the Ice Age. Um, they don't even understand that Romans also used coal. And there was a uh, an energy crisis in Britain because they ran out of wood. Um, so, I mean, it, the first Clean Air Act was 561 AD in, in, in Constantinople. I mean, so these are issues that have been going on for millennia. I mean, it's not something that's brand new. Uh, and I don't see this as working out very well because it's the same problem. Schwab is, is really a Marxist. Um, he even has, keeps his statue of Lenin on his bookshelf. All right. <clears throat> and they think that um, the only reason communism failed was because they didn't have the U.S. and Europe as well. And I, w you know, I went to China um, I was called in back then and uh, helping them become capitalist. And they took me to a facility, which was very interesting. It was surrounded by tanks, but it had about 300 people and they're all down and downloading everything from the internet. And um, what the Chinese impressed me with was that they were not interfering, but they were monitoring everything. 
trying to study it and how did it function. And uh, uh, they showed me they were tracking 249 varieties of tea. I had no idea there was that many. Um, and they wanted to know, like, this one selling for a dollar here, but like $10 over there. Um, how could that be? You know, and it was in communism. If it was a dollar here, it had to be a dollar over there. And I said, well, where is it, you know, coming from? Well, where was the dollar was the origin? All right. Well, first you have transportation costs. And they went, oh, really? I mean, you know, you know I was dealing at a level of almost kindergarten. Uh, having to reteach how things function. And I said, you know, then somebody will pay something more for this versus the other one because they like it better. Oh, really? You know, I mean, we had, you know, a, a couple of, uh, we had one Russian girl that came in and was in the United States. She was uh, on our programming team and it was funny to listen to her. She, you know, when she went shopping, it was a crisis. I said, why? She said, well, when we go to get toilet paper, there's only one brand. You, you people have like 30. How do I make a decision? Uh, so it was interesting to see that kind of change to a, a thinking process. Um, and so I, I think that you, we have to understand that uh, Putin was not KGB wanting to reestablish the USSR. All that was propaganda. If he dared try, the people would have revolted against them. Um, uh, you know, they didn't, you know, they got their freedom and they didn't want to hand it back. Just on, uh, the, on the note of, of Putin, there's been a raging debate. It's it's uh, not ceasing. You know, Klaus Schwab has referred, referenced Putin as a young global leader. But when you look at the list, Putin was not on there. I, I, I am told by someone that there was like a Russian version or extension of the, that Davos thing. And three Russians were chosen and Putin was one of them. Uh, but um, I mean, apart from that, how do you evaluate this sort of intricate relationship between Davos and, and Moscow and whether Putin has completely separated from the West and he's he's pushing back against the Great Reset? What, what's your thought on that? Yes, no, he is. I mean, that's why they um, honestly, they had to take out Trump. They had to take out uh, Putin and they had to take out Jane. Um, the three of them were the ones standing uh, in the way of all this great reset, and climate change and everything else. Um, and. You know, they got rid of Trump. And as soon as they did, instantaneously, you saw this whole thing shutting down fossil fuels or whatever. Um, and Putin's the same way. I mean, he's not going to shut down, you know, his economy. And um, as far as his young global leaders, he did not attend any class. Um Basically, Schwab, for pro, you know, propaganda purposes, was nominating people for it. Uh, but they didn't attend his class like Trudeau did. Uh, uh, that was quite different. And, and the same thing down in New Zealand. Um, there are people that have attended his classes and have been indoctrinated into his economic views. And they are effectively Marxist. It's the same thing about we have to control the people. Um, I mean, that's part of what COVID was. Um, I mean, now you find uh, people that were in the White House coming out with books and saying there was no support whatsoever for lockdowns. Um, and, um, and then Fauci comes out. Well, I never said talked about a lockdown. Lockdowns don't do anything. They never did. Uh, and they've never been attempted like that in, in, in history. Uh, you've uh, quarantined a city when there was, you know, uh, maybe, you know, cholera or something like that, but uh, you didn't lock people down. Um, and it's it caused tremendous damage. Um, a lot of small businesses were lost because of it. Um, I had a former um, uh, personal assistant, she, you know, uh, left maybe about five years ago or so and I got married and her and her husband opened up a, a spa in Philadelphia, maybe three months before the COVID they lost everything they had. Um, so, I mean, this is just, the COVID was basically uh, 
all orchestrated to effectively exert control. Um, and the only people that I know that got seriously ill were the ones that were vaccinated. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're seeing that more and more. And I've, I've interviewed Dr. Jessica Rose and other uh, scientists. And, and uh, even more and more of us are seeing this on an anecdotal basis. Like people that we know are now suffering uh, from these I injections. And um, I, I just heard from a colleague in my former workplace where they imposed the mandate for vaccination. Five professors now have had heart attacks, which is unheard uh, of. And um, ju just I, I get a lot of communication from people just maybe to get your thoughts on just some tips, given everything that we're experiencing now uh, on what to do. There's a lot of people playing places like Mexico, where, where, where I usually am, and just people getting out of cities, buying real assets, you know, farmland, uh, precious metals, you know, stuff like I, I, what would be sort of your reaction? Just any big tips or themes on, on what, what to do for the average person now? Well, we, we do have um, a historical trend that was uh, set in motion, probably accelerated by, by COVID. And that is the depopulation of the city. So people, I mean, like real estate in the suburbs outside of New York, going up dramatically, but inside New York was going down. Uh, same thing in Chicago, uh, LA. Uh, California's lost more people than than ever. Um, traffic in Florida has like doubled. <laughs> uh, so it's, if you look at ancient Rome, the, the very term su suburb is suburbium, which was a flight from Rome uh, at its peak, it had a million uh, population <clears throat> around 180 AD. And to put that in perspective, no city ever reached a million until the Victorian age in London. So it was a very, very long time. Uh, when the <clears throat> corruption was rising in, in Rome, little by little, people left and went to the, to the suburbs. The same thing. And that's what ended up uh, becoming more or less the feudal system. These lords would create a little uh, uh, castle with a wall, and they provided the uh, safety for the people, and they would farm the land. And if uh, an enemy came, they all ran into the castle. Um, so that's how feudalism even came about, because there was no longer a centralized government to protect them. Uh, so. Uh, we're looking at that trend again. People are leaving, uh, I would say, primarily the major cities, just about everywhere. People are fleeing. Um, you look in Europe, America, um, et cetera, even in China. And <clears throat> because you go to the big cities, they're the ones that have been locked down, draconian uh, I, you know, orders, you know, Shanghai, for example, whatever. So, um <clears throat> You, you have that trend set in motion. And in addition to this, now we have these financial crises with war, et cetera. So I know a lot of Germans have been leaving for South America, um, been going to Uruguay or Paraguay or, uh, or Mexico. Uh, so it's, this is simply a trend that, that is being repeated in history with, with the fall of Rome. Um, and eventually, that's what I think we end up in. Uh, my computer, which does the, the geopolitical forecasting, uh, I mean, it's never been wrong. I mean, uh, I did a, actually an interview in RT. Um, they called because our computer had put out that Ukraine would be the hot spot, and that was the forecast coming out in 2013. So they wouldn't know how, you know, how does, how do you know that? I mean, as look, the computer is monitoring absolutely everything and it, it picks up things that you or I wouldn't look at. And, and I've learned over the years, um, we had a, a client, Universal Bank of Lebanon, and they found a book with uh, <clears throat> the Lebanese pound written down for more than a hundred years. And they asked us if we could do a model. I said, sure, send it over. <clears throat> we put it in and the computer came out and said, your country's going to fall apart in eight days. 
I thought it was some sort of mistake. I called them and I said, look, something's got to be wrong with this data. It says it's going to, your country is going to fall apart in eight days. <clears throat> Very calmly, he asked, well, what currency would you recommend? I said, well, it says Swiss, Swiss franc. I said, you don't think this is crazy? Eight days later, the civil war began. So what it's doing, and I saw the same thing with Iran, Iraq war, um, <clears throat> and then even with the collapse of Russia in 98, it's picking up capital flows. So uh, if China were going to invade the United States, the first thing we do is start reducing its holdings of American debt. Um, and that's what he was seeing. He was seeing capital starting to flow. So the people that know they're going to start an attack in eight days, they're getting their money the hell out of there. Um, and it took me a while to figure this out, but this is what the computer and how it's been able to monitor all these things around the world that I don't think an individual would have seen. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they're very subtle movements, but that's what happens. So <clears throat> we're seeing that now you see the dollar rising sharply because a lot of people in Europe feel that war is coming. And <clears throat> The United States was a third world country. JP Morgan had to bail it out with a $100 million gold loan in 1896. <clears throat> what made the United States the world leading economy? It was World War I and II. All the money fled Europe, came over here. I mean, if tanks are rolling down the street, you're not going to leave your gold sitting there in a bank. Um, so by the end of World War II, the U.S. had 76% of the world gold reserves. Um, that's why the dollar became the reserve currency. So all these things are affected. Um, they affect capital flows, and that's what we're seeing already. The capital flows continue to pour out of Europe. Uh, Europe will, will eventually collapse. Um, this, the differences in, in interest rates, um, they were promised they were all going to pay the same. That's how they sold the euro. Um, when you're looking at these differentials and people who sell the Italian bonds to buy the German, I mean, this is creates conflict internally. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of the EU and I'm speaking as an EU uh, citizen and I, I do hope it <laughs> collapses because in my opinion, it's a totalitarian construct, um, new European Soviet as Bukowski said. Um, so the book that's coming out, the plot to seize Russia, if you've got any you know, final thought for us, uh, as well as, you know, what people can find at armstrongeconomics.com. I know you've got books and reports. I've purchased some of your reports in the past. You've got your service and uh, subscription service and uh, the upcoming World Economic Conference. Uh, if you want to let us know, you know, what's, what's most important there. Well, that um, <clears throat> that will be held in Orlando, uh, November uh, 11th through 13th. But it's also um it will be available for streaming around the world. Uh, <clears throat> as we, <clears throat> we started streaming at it uh, when COVID happened because a lot of people couldn't travel. Um, so they're more of a, <clears throat> um, actually I did one in, in 2019 in Rome and, and uh, Nigel Farage came and he, and he said, of course he came because we're the alternative to Davos. <laughs> um, so it, we started our conferences in 1985 and Schwab started his in 87. It seems like whatever I do, he tries to, to copy it one way or another. The guy that did the movie on me, the forecaster, he called and, and he did the movie on him, the forum. Um, <clears throat> so it's been an, an interesting thing between the two of us going back and forth for, for decades. But he's just a communist and I'm, uh, and I'm really a, a free market guy. That's really what it comes down to. So um, the World Economic Forum is where we go over the entire world. Uh, the, we put out the computer forecast for all these different countries so you can see it collectively and understand. Um, it's not my personal opinion. <clears throat> so uh, that's what's critical because none of us can ever be 100% correct on a personal opinion because we can't see it all. Uh, that's really the main issue. Yeah, I, I refer to uh, Klaus uh, as Cobra Commander 
Klaus Schwab, the head of World Economic Forum. I, I guess I'll have to come up for um, uh, a title for, for you, but a more, uh, you know, uh, benevolent uh, one because <laughs> you're, you're fighting against uh, and speaking out against this uh, tyranny. And again, the website is armstrongeconomics.com. People can find uh, everything there. And again, thanks, you, thanks for coming back on Geopolitics and Empire. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit and Twitter take down posts. And after the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.